What started with a virus so small, your eyes couldn't see it. This is about providing a future for humanity. Wir schaffen das. The Commission has decided to fine Google 4.34 billion euros. Mr. Piano, è l'occasione della vita. This is your man on the moon moment. We are innovating here and we hope that you like it. D'une force commune d'intervention. Long live Europa. Long live Europe. Vive l'Europe. Welcome to Europe Calling, a series of podcasts brought to you by the European Commission, looking at the politics and policies of the Union today. With me, Stephen Jones. And me, Paul Anderson. Today, the spotlight is on Europe's energy crisis, where industry is dealing with severe shortages after Russia cut off gas supplies, and where consumers are facing skyrocketing gas and electricity prices in the coming winter months. We're very pleased to welcome today our main guest, Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. Commissioner Simpson, many thanks indeed for joining us as things change in this energy crisis day by day, hour by hour even. Thank you. Our first questions for you are about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the consequences for energy supply coming into Europe. What is the situation now as we move towards winter? Will we be fully cut off from Russian gas? Right now the situation is serious because uh, 13 member states are either already fully or partially cut off and we cannot figure out uh, the risk that there will be full disruption. But we are prepared. Our underground gas storage is uh, more than 88% uh, full and we have diversified our supply routes. So uh, the risk is there. Nothing uh, gives us guarantees that Russia will respect their long-term contracts, but uh, preparatory work is also uh, done by our side. Could you expand a little bit more on what's been done so far in terms of diversification of supply uh, and also stockage of, uh, of supplies underground? Russia started manipulating our gas market a year ago when they didn't fill uh, their underground gas storage that was owned by their entities. A year ago, Gas flows from Russia represented 40% of our consumption, and now they are down to nine. And we have been successfully replacing this with alternatives. So a um, big part was played by LNG deliveries. In spring, our President von der Leyen, together with US President, um, announced that uh, we will receive, on top of the existing volumes, plus 15 BCM of um, LNG from United States. and. Right now, we have received that and the volumes are still flowing in. But also our trustworthy partners with whom we do have pipeline connection, Norway, Algeria, Azerbaijan, have stepped up their production and we have received significantly higher volumes for, from them too. You've talked about the problem of Russian gas supply, the reliability. But at the same time, earlier this year, the Commission said that Europe will reduce or seek to reduce its uh, import of Russian gas by two thirds by the end of the year. So how much progress uh, are we making in that respect? Is it realistic to assume we can get to zero at all? For this shift to zero, we need to continue with the energy savings and efficiency measures, as well as with ramping up renewable energy. So it will be impossible to replace the volumes of natural gas that we receive from Russia uh, with the production of alternative suppliers. We will manage, if we will produce homegrown renewables, to replace the consumption of natural gas. And we need savings, both uh, savings um, of natural gas, and member states agreed that there is a target to reduce gas consumption by 15%. And we have to address electricity consumption at peak hours. Commissioner, thanks very much indeed. Let's hear now from Arthur Lorkowski. He's the director of the energy community, which is a conglomerate of countries, most of them inside the European Union, but including several outside, to coordinate energy policy and energy supplies on the line. Yeah. Many thanks indeed for joining us here on Europe Calling. Thank you for having me and thank you for invitation. Tell me, first of all, just to give an overview, what state is Ukraine's energy infrastructure in right now? And what, in your view, was the most severe damage done by Russian forces to this infrastructure? If you let me, I will give you two numbers. They are, I think, uh, very much representative for that what is happening right now. Ukraine amid war and amid the atrocities caused by the Russian army. 
more than 700,000 consumers remained without power due to the war and more than 625,000 of consumers are without gas. Mostly affected are the regions where the war atrocities are happening. I mean, uh, of course, Zaporozhia, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, Odessa, Mykolaiv and Donetsk. And this is regionally the, the focus of the atrocities made by the Russian army in Ukraine. Give us an outline of the Ukraine support group and fund. What has it achieved so far and what contingency measures are being put in place for the coming winter months? We are providing Ukraine with two services. The first one is the coordination of supplies of the equipment, materials and stuff needed for repairs. And that's what we have already achieved an amount of more than 500 tons of different materials and stuff already delivered to Ukraine from uh, more than 13 countries of Europe within 25 shipments. The other service we are providing is the Fiduciary Fund, which has been established by the Secretariat on request of Commissioner Simpson. And we are collecting money from donors to support the necessary procurement processes to repair infrastructure in Ukraine. What is the nature of the collaboration between the European Union and the energy community? I think that extremely important is the political support which has been given by Commissioner Simpson. I would like to underline also an excellent cooperation with uh, the Emergency Response Coordination Centre which is part of the European Union Civil Protection Mechanism. I think these guys, they are doing an excellent job in coordination with the Energy Community Secretariat in providing Ukraine uh, with necessary equipment. And a word, perhaps, on your assessment of the level of needs in Ukraine coming into winter. We have to recognize the fact that Ukraine is amid the war. So it means that the consumption in Ukraine when it comes to electricity dropped by 30% in comparison to the previous year. That creates the situation which allows Ukraine for now to, to export electricity. But we can expect Ukrainian consumption to grow. And there are several risk, which are connected with this challenge. Firstly, this is very unstable generation in uh, nuclear power plants, uh, including Zaporozhne power plant, which uh, generates two gigawatts to the system and is a very serious source of electricity. However, this uh, nuclear power plant is being the target of Russian shellings, what makes the situation very unpredictable in this regard. We can also expect shortages of gas as uh, the transit through Ukraine is uh, very uh, unpredictable when it comes to the decisions by Russia. Another risk for the winter is the lack of coal. Some of uh, thermal power plants being very close to the uh, combat areas. This is the reality. The Ukrainian government is uh, attacking every day. So how much does the current energy crisis in Europe threaten energy support for Ukraine? So far, Ukraine being at war is stabilizing the European electricity system. For now, what I want to underline is Ukraine providing European Union with electricity and we hope that the situation will last as long as it would be possible. Great, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Lorkovsky. Thank you very much, guys. You've heard that commissioner, his view of the situation in Ukraine and what kind of winter they're going to face now. While many, it's clear, are facing hardships in Europe, it's going to be nothing like what they're facing in Ukraine. What are you doing to support Ukraine through the coming months? I'm glad to hear from Artur Lorkovsky because he and his team in energy community, they are... Um, helping Ukraine day by day and they are working extremely closely with uh, Ukrainian uh, specialists. We have been also working together with International Atomic Energy Agency to help stabilize the nuclear situation in Ukraine because uh, Russian behavior 
in this regard, they are shelling the nuclear power plants. They have occupied the European biggest nuclear power plant in Zaporozhye. This is a very worrisome um, and absolutely unacceptable action from Russian military side. Well, you talked about technical and material support. What about political support? Because you're wearing the ribbon of the Ukraine flag with the blue and yellow. There's strong political support we've seen from the Commission throughout this crisis. But I want to know your views on the risk that support will begin to ebb away from member states and from the European public. You know, can this support continue? Will it continue? And, and, and how can we make sure that that solidarity will go on, given the pressures that the public in democratic societies will be under this winter? Well, this support will be there as long as Ukraine needs us to support them, and we will also support them to rebuild their country after they have uh, restored the control over their borders. But the biggest uh, well testimony that, uh, that there is a broad support, uh, I think, uh, is our packages of sanctions. Russians don't get the necessary equipment for their uh, oil or gas production sites, and, and we will not buy their uh, oil products uh, starting from December. For me, well, every day, Putin regime demonstrates more clearly how rotten this regime is and and what their real intentions are. So this makes uh, our choice very clear, and we have to support Ukraine so that they can prevail. That takes us very neatly into an examination of the situation here in Europe and the kind of challenges that consumers um, face. Before we move on to some questions to you regarding that, let's just hear from your president, from your boss, uh, making her State of the European Union address to the European Parliament on measures that she would like to see uh, introduced in Europe. We are proposing a cap on the revenues of companies that produce electricity at low costs. These companies are making revenues they never accounted for, they never even dreamt of. And don't get me wrong, in our social market economy, profits are okay, they are good. But in these times, it is wrong to receive extraordinary record revenues and profits benefiting from war and on the back of our consumers. In these times, profits must be shared and channeled to those who need it most. So you heard there from your president um, proposing a cap on revenues. Could you explain exactly how you will share and channel these profits back to citizens? Our president's quote highlights exactly the most important thing, uh, that we need to protect our businesses and people. And we have been working on this since uh, since last autumn already, because uh, then the Russian manipulation um, already started. The most important steps we have taken um, are to cap the profits of the electricity companies uh, that have received windfall revenues. And um, these profits... Um, our necessary contribution for the member state budget so that they can support the retail consumers. With these additional revenues, um, also important is that in these extraordinary times, we must be ready to use measures that we would otherwise not support, such as regulated prices. We have made it um, possible for the member states to put in place controlled prices that are lower than the actual cost of electricity. And these prices can now be extended not only to the private households, but also small and medium businesses. I want to bring in now uh, Monique Goyens, who's the Director General of BEOC, the European Consumer Organization, for the consumer perspective on this pricing uh, crisis that's happening in Europe for consumers. Let's play you what she says. There is a risk that millions of people will not be able to, uh, to pay their energy bill. Uh, and these people need financial and not only financial support to keep up with their payments. And they also need to be able to invest into reducing their energy consumption. They need much clearer information from energy suppliers on tariffs. And there is also no more time to lose. We need beyond these uh, very important short term measures. We also expect further measures from Europe to deal with this crisis longer term in the months ahead. So you heard there uh, Monique Goyens um, from Bayouk suggesting that what you were mentioning just a moment ago may not quite be enough 
for consumers. So have you got further measures in the pipeline in this regard? And if so, what are they? I very much agree with this comment uh, that many consumers will face difficult winter. And despite the fact that member states have already done a good job putting support measures in place, um, now they need additional funds to continue to expand these uh, support schemes. And this is where our recent measures will come in. And it's also true that we need to look beyond financial support uh, to address also um, structural effects uh, that will last longer than one winter. You referred earlier to uh, potential price regulation, a policy in the free market in Europe that you don't necessarily wish to um, pursue, but that circumstances demand at the moment. Many Europeans would say here, here to that. I'm just wondering whether you think this is potentially opening a door to wider, more long-term policy changes within the European energy market. The current market design has guaranteed a very important thing for Europe, that the supply is always met with demand. And unlike other places across the globe, we have not seen blackouts for decades. But it's also clear that our current system was not designed for wartime, and we are in a situation where, due to Russian actions, energy demand right now is bigger than supply. So um, right now we need emergency intervention measures. But, uh, but we have already also proposed a long list of um, these actions, and, uh, and they will help us through um, these challenging times. For long-term reform, the work is also ongoing to... Um, change our electricity market design where renewables are covering majority of our um, energy consumption. You talked there about the challenge of meeting emergency intervention measures with long-term ambitions. Now, the current crisis has brought into sharp focus the ambition, the scope of the ambition of the European Green Deal. Can we continue with the Green Deal as it is, given the crisis? Is it realistic to implement in the current situation and is there support for that among the public? This is even more relevant than ever because if we had been further along to the path towards net zero, our situation today would be much better and we would have been much less vulnerable to this crisis. What we are seeing today is um, the consequences of uh, being too dependent on one fossil fuel provider. Uh, well, this, is, uh, this was Russia. And uh, to replace this dependency, um, renewables are a, a solution. They are not only green, but they are also affordable and homegrown, so no one can turn off wind or solar for us. As um, I'm responsible for not only for current crisis, but also for long-term policies, then uh, this is clear that we will uh, continue to implement the Green Deal. You're listening to Europe Calling, and our guest today is Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. As you may know from previous episodes of this programme, this is where we move from the hard policy topics to the softer, more personal side of our guests to reveal a bit about the person behind the title. So, Commissioner, a few quick-fire questions coming up from us which demand quicker answers. The first of which, questions-wise, is what would you like your tenure as Energy Commissioner to be remembered for? Well, this will be time when Europe will get rid of the dependence on Russian fossil fuels and moves quickly towards net zero. Countries closer to Russia were warning about Vladimir Putin long ago, notably after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Did you see Vladimir Putin's actions today coming earlier? The countries I know best, they knew that this might happen. And that's why they are less dependent on Russian fossil fuels than the rest of the East and Central Europe. But well, now it's not time to well, point fingers to someone. Now it's time to, well, uh, to step up our readiness to tackle this crisis and uh, do it in a unified uh, way. What for you is the crowning achievement of the EU? single market, but also peace and unity that we have uh, had ourselves and that we want to well support our closest neighbours. You spoke earlier about energy saving measures. What do you do to save energy? If possible, I walk instead of taking a car. And since war started, I switched off my uh, heating here in Brussels apartment. What gives you energy to get through the day? During the day, a couple of minutes outdoors, uh, they help uh, immensely. 
there's probably not much of it um, nowadays, but what do you do uh, in your downtime? Indeed. Right now I cannot do that uh, I would like to do, but uh, spending time in the nature and meeting friends, this always uh, helps a lot. What's your preferred type of, of renewable energy? I do like all of them, but I enjoy sunshine, so maybe that hints a little bit. <laughs> well, you don't get much of that in Estonia, I guess. And I'm not surprised. That's why you can value it. <laughs> and just a final question. How realistic do you think the EU's goal to be climate neutral by 2050 is? It needs investments into research and innovation because not all the technological solutions that we will need to become climate neutral are market ready yet. But if there is a agreement, if there is a will to move towards climate neutrality, then for sure we will achieve that. Not only us, but there is a broad coalition of different nations who have joined us with that goal. Kadri Simpson, European Union Commissioner for Energy, many thanks indeed for those answers there and many thanks for your time today. Thank you for interesting conversation. And thank you to our other guests, Arta Lokowski from the Energy Community, Monique Goyens from Bayuk, and of course, thank you to you for listening. We look forward to your company at the next edition of Europe Calling for now. It's goodbye from me, Stephen Jones. And goodbye from me, Paul Anderson. What started with a virus so small, your eyes couldn't see it. This is about... Providing future for humanity. Wir schaffen das. The Commission has decided to fine Google 4.34 billion euros. This is Europe man on the moon moment. We are innovating here and we hope that you like it. Une force commune d'intervention. Long live Europe. Long live Europe. Vive l'Europe.